How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I'm talking to Mikas from We Make Dance Music and Progressive Groove Records. Uh, how you doing, Mikas? I'm great. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well. And thanks again for taking the time to do this. I know we're yeah. all busy people and I appreciate your time very much. It's a pleasure, man. It's always good to talk about uh, what we love to do. You know, it's uh, every day for me. Mm -hmm. It's every day for you, and it's this is this is the best thing to do to chat. You know, to get people to hopefully understand a bit more about what we do and inside of it. You know, what's really at right. the core of uh, somebody who do that all day, every day. So, yeah, I. It's funny. I've really found, especially doing the podcast, like having a little time to just talk about it. Really, sometimes is almost as valuable as working. Just with yeah. the ideas and the inspiration you get from someone else, and just a different perspective on stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, cool. I'm I'm happy to do it myself. <laughs> totally, there's a good perspective even on what you do. When you talk about it, you get to understand what you do a bit more because you're busy doing it. You don't think about it, but when you see it instinctively, mm -hmm. because what you do, you're like, oh, yeah, I actually done all these things now, and you recall, you're like, oh, that's that's good. Yeah. This is nice. Uh, it's, it's, it's progress. So. Right. Yeah. And it's definitely mm -hmm. hard to uh, always find people in your everyday life that want to talk about the minute little things that you do that make a big difference. I, I adjusted the threshold on the compressor by 2 dB and now the track is really, you know, like people uh, just, just get tired of that fast. <laughs> yeah. I just realized that my track were way too loud all of a sudden. Uh, I don't know how, but yeah, it happened today. And I just mm -hmm. started dropping them like 6 dB because... Mm -hmm. It just sound better at the end, you know. So yeah. if, you, if you things like that, yeah, it happened. I watched a tutorial the other the other day about uh, LUFS, L U F S uh -huh. for really the the overall gain of a track. I'm like, oh my god, this is very interesting. I've been producing music for a very long time. This I didn't I, I I'd get that first time, and then I watched the video again because I was like, oh, this is really important. And then iTunes and Spotify is actually pushing now for track to be lower level, not yeah. higher level. They're pushing, they want people to lower the, 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 the loudness of the track. So on the other end, the customer will enjoy it more, which is great. They can do that with technology and, you know, it, it help. It will help the listener, I believe, in the end because, you know, the last 25 years of loudness war, I've been damaging a lot of music. Yeah. Personally, I like better to listen to the original version, 1979 Pink Floyd, The Wall, the original recording, which has very nice dynamics and stuff. It's clean. The newer one, well, they remastered it, you know, yeah. and I don't know. I just don't don't feel it as much as the original. And th those masters is 19, 1979, I believe. So it's it's it was the heyday. It's with big console, big mixing, big thing, and you, you can hear it. It's it's well, you can feel it really. So I would say. Yeah, the loudness wars, in case anyone doesn't know or aren't familiar with it, basically people want their music to be loud. I guess this is probably because we listen to like shuffled music much more. Like you put mm -hmm. on your iPod or whatever and you shuffle it. iPod, like people have iPods anymore. <laughs> yeah, those doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Too. <laughs> but, oh. but you want your track to be as loud as the next one that comes on. And it's caused engineers, mastering engineers and, and home producers, especially I think to just make their tracks as loud as possible, totally crushing out any dynamics. And, well, and uh, it's nice that there's you're starting to see the, like uh, some of the streaming services like kind of like adopting standards and mm -hmm. um, f you know formats that they prefer because I think we kind of needed someone to sort of look over us all and say hey guys <laughs> like, calm down and let's not it's it's the sad thing the sad thing about I would say about that is simply that uh, you know if you're a producer and you make music. Your chance to stand out as a DJ on Beatport is maybe five seconds. Okay, yeah. so you browse on Beatport, you listen to your new releases, and you click, 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 and you have five seconds. If the sound doesn't ring a bell to you, you're gonna skip to the next. You know, I, I mean, mostly if you have a gig that night, or if you're an active DJ and you're very, uh, you need some tracks, you know, for the night or for a gig, and you're shopping, and you're busy, you're gonna go and you're gonna oh that sound that sound that sound yes that no 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 no. So if yeah. something stand out because it's louder, you get a chance. Of course, I would say these days if you're in the deep house category, probably half of them are are quite tame. You know they're not heavy. Then you go into they call it big room now I believe, and it's just blasting so uh -huh. loud. There's such a contrast in between. It's like 
oh my God, what's happening? So some purists still, I think, preserve that. So And on a vinyl, if you overcompress it, it would sound terrible. Right. So you cannot, you have to leave some room, you know, when when you prepare a track for vinyl as an example to, to, to have those dynamic. If not, it's just going to be like a groove that's going to be full of chunk and there's uh-huh. going to be distortion. It's, it's, it's impossible, so... Yeah, it's a anyway. funny phenomenon that has happened. And like you mentioned, the Pink Floyd thing. And, you know, I've seen some pretty interesting videos of like uh, remasters of classic albums where all the life is sucked out of it. There's a really good video comparison of Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. Oh. And, and it shows the, if you know, like the little guitar riff that starts off, it's just the quiet little guitar and then the drums come in. They're so huge. But they did the uh, like modern remaster and the guitar starts out real loud and the drums come in and they're just like da 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 they have like no power no impact that was what that's what it's all about dynamics yeah. you know if you have like uh, something that's at minus 22 db that's in a little corner and it's nice there it, it fits there you know it's mm. great and then you just bring some punch and it does punch you know if not well it's just like a big yeah. sausage they call it some people say sausage some people say whatever but it's like a the waveform, yeah. It's just yeah. a sausage. It's, it's, it's a tube, you know, it's full, full of, of stuff. It's just a brick of sound. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's, that's, I think this is an interesting thing, you know, about just using technology to see what's happening. I watched mm-hmm. that tutorial. I just, oh, I'm like, okay, well, and I actually realized I'm not actually mastering that loud. So I was happy that day. I was like, I looked. I'm like, okay, I'm at, you know, minus 12. I'm not at minus 16. But I'm not at minus six, so yeah. it's, it's acceptable, so I would say. So yeah, well, you, I, I, I take more care in the future, I would say. Yeah, you leave yourself the room to have those big moments. If everything's a big moment, then nothing. Big is only big if something small is next to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you have just those huge sounds all the time, you really have no sounds that are huge. Mm. But it's so, so tempting is I think part of the problem is, especially like for me, as I work alone a lot and I make each sound I'm working into the track, it, it's so tempting like, okay, this bass is going to be really huge. And then I'm going to layer this really awesome drum under it. That's giant. Cause you're working on one thing at a time. It's, it can be difficult to say, all right, this is going to be the little sound. That's not really that exciting on its own, <laughs> but might, hopefully. Add, yeah, might add a lot later, but. I, I know like I just I, I struggle with that as far as because I do like to make a lot of my own sounds. So mm-hmm. a lot of times I they're always loud because I'm working on them one at a time. Something I have to think about. Yeah, I think I think it's it will it will evolve, not fast, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, if some people like we said at the top are setting a standard. Yeah. If people people will think about it, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about it now. You know, we're talking about it. Some people is going to be, oh, scratching their heads a little bit, and they're going to be, oh, maybe we should just have a look at this, you know. So, so music is really appreciated to the fullest, which is yeah, yeah. important. Totally, totally. So, uh, I want to, of course, talk to you about your site, WeMakeDanceMusic.com. Tell us yeah, about it. Yeah, We Make Dance Music is a uh, very cool site. Yeah. This is. is uh, website. It's basically a music production marketplace where anyone can up by anyone. I mean, yeah, anyone really actually. Anyone can upload and download mainly project files. You know, like Ableton Project, Logic Pro Project, FL Studio, and Cubase. Mm-hmm. Uh, project entail that you make a track, you package it, and you upload it on the web so somebody else can download it. And, you know, do a remix of it, uh, perform with it, uh, get inspired of it. You know, it's, uh, I think all music, you know, somehow come from other music. And if you start with a bass, it's a very strong starting point, you know, of an idea. And most of the project have MIDI. They, some have plugins, some don't, you know, depending on the producer. You know, we really hit, give 100% creative freedom. So if somebody makes something with uh, 15 plugins on it, well, the other chance that somebody will have all those plugins and will want the track is much lesser. So if somebody makes something with two plugins, refine his craft, get better at it and use, really make music, like really put the work into it, not get all the plugins to do the work, That's, which is a bit of a, another problem we can talk about. So, so you get the project file, you open it, and then you get a track. Mm-hmm. Somebody made a track, could be a trap track, could be a trance track, could be anything. And everybody got their own way to create, you know, in a DAW. There's no specific way to use a software, really. You can build a certain way. I'm going to build a certain way. It's same software, completely different approach, completely different vision, completely different results, hopefully. 
and and I think Project Files are it's it's the highest value knowledge I could have shared. So I started this. You know, I started the. We make them then in 2012 of a studio meetup that I was doing every week, creating music with uh, my co-producer. And we finished the session. He sent me the file via WeTransfer. I get home and I mix and engineer them because I had a better setup and I'm a more, I'm much more a mix engineer than a composer, I would say. Mm-hmm. And then one of his place, I get a notification on my email. I look and I'm like, oh, he sent me the file. I'm like, it just came to me. He's like, hey, we could do something with those files. There's something to do there. And then I thought, would I buy those files? I'm like, yeah, I would buy those files. And then that's it, you know. And I think the highest value of this whole concept is the person that upload actually get to share a whole lot. You know, it's a whole lot. And on the other end, he's getting paid for it. You know, it's not he's not going to make a, a one hundredth of a cent for a Spotify stream. He's going to make uh, you know ten bucks, eight dollar, twelve dollar, fifteen dollars. So if you put the work in. I think you can make a living. We have uh, about 20 artists that make a living completely of what they do on the site, you know, which is very encouraging. So oh, yeah, that's, that's another aspect of it. So it's started six years ago with three producers, uh, maybe 30 products. And now we have 300 and something producers and 4,900 products. Really? Wow, that's, those are some good numbers. And, you know, the music business is so difficult, right, uh, to begin with. And, like, trying to sell music is harder and harder because, especially now when we can stream it, the entire catalog of recorded music for $15 a month. Oh, yeah. It, we're so used to having music instantly that we just, it's there as soon as we want it. And um, this is just a great way, I think, to um, have artists market their music and have another way to actually you know, make a career doing music without mm-hmm. relying on solely sales or solely touring. This this idea of like sharing the knowledge and sharing the tools is um, really a powerful way. And I think it's something a lot of people should think about if they're making music, they want to, you know, share that with the community of other producers. Yeah, I think uh, the, the the value of it is, is extremely high for both parties. Mm-hmm. You know, if it be one side... You know, there's uh, there's a lot of side selling sounds and selling certain things. It's good, but the value of a project to me is 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 immense. You know, I can't even explain it because I'm so passionate about it because it developed so well over the last six years that it's proven time and time again that the people on the other end, wherever they are in uh, Colombia, they could have sold some some things in Afghanistan, in China. We reach really everywhere, and you know, you could be in a small village somewhere, download a project file, and have a blast, you know, doing with it. You can, yes, you can get music production courses, but if you, I give you the, the most concrete example that I've seen is that, okay, you, you produce music for twenty years, okay? Maybe you produce rock and roll, okay? Have you ever made, uh, have you ever worked on a future based track? No, mm-hmm. okay. How about you take those twenty years of experience and instead of putting it into rock and roll, you put them into future based, you know? you're going to reinterpret it. You're going to do something that it's impossible to do otherwise, I believe, because your roots are based on to what you've done. But if you take that as a starting point, it's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different pattern that you start. It's, it's, very, it's much more innovative. And uh, in my point of view, too, since I know very much about the history of dance music, being in dance music for 25 years now, uh, house music evolved from people sampling stuff and mixing and remixing yeah. and taking pattern and everybody that make dance music uh, take uh, Michael Jackson or whoever and put it and twist it and do anything and I think this is the ultimate remix tool you know? so that's that's it and for for the people that are coming that you know I think I think selling a product and making twelve dollars fifteen dollar ten dollar is very rewarding. You know that there's somebody on the other end that is having a blast in the studio, you know, or he's in his notebook in a cafe and he's, he's grooving to it. And this is like, uh, wow, you know, what an idea. So, and uh, uh, let's go on. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree because the, the value of like taking kind of this peek behind the curtain by looking inside the project file, you know, as any producer, just to see, like you said, there's a million different ways to do the same thing, to use software. I, I'm, in, I'm into Ableton Live, that's my big one, but I see people using it for all different kinds of purposes. 
And it's always inspiring. It always says, oh, I didn't think I could do that. And you see what they're doing can really teach you something. And to your point about like um, focusing on like, say, a genre like rock and roll. I know for me, like that's where I came up playing guitar, playing in rock bands. Um, but when I started getting into producing on a computer and a little more electronic stuff, synthesizers, drum machines, it really just kind of like blew the doors open. And it was also a little surprising to know that there's this whole other world out there and this whole other styles that I didn't know nothing about. And now I'm going to bring what I understand to that. And it's, it's so exciting what you can do. I think when somebody downloads a project file too, like for say they release their album on your site and someone downloads their whole project file with all the songs and everything, they get a really intimate connection with the music too. You get to hear those like yeah. soloed tracks. And I mean, for some of my favorite artists, I, I love hearing like the stems basically of their music and just maybe their isolated vocal or their guitar playing or something. It's, it's so eye opening and mm -hmm. it's a great way to learn. You know, you're, you're really learning like by example, rather than like out of the textbook or something like that, or out of the, the video, you're, you're seeing it done before your eyes. Yeah, something about that that's very inspiring for me is I've seen the, the creation of probably the most legendary album. Well, I'm a big uh, progressive rock fan, by the way, so mm -hmm. you're going to understand that. Cool. So I've seen Alan Parson mixing The Dark Side of the Moon. You know, Alan Parson is the engineer behind. He's also one of my favorite progressive rock artists. So they made a documentary about the making, you know, because it was so big. And you see him at AB Road behind the deck with all the stuff, soloing parts, you know, and saying, oh, yeah, we put that little reverb effect. And, oh, man, this is, That's wow, cool. yeah. you know, would I be able to do that with those stems eventually? I really hope so. But yeah. the point is that, that like, you're just there. You're here with him, you know. It's mm -hmm. like, wow, man. And they talk about the making of the album, the studio session, everything is inventory, repertory, and they still have everything. This was 1975. Eh? Right. They still have all the master tapes, they have everything. Just seeing that, at some point I was like, wow, this is so inspiring. This guy is such a genius, you know, and with mm -hmm. with projects, you get that, you know, you get that uh, that feeling, you know. I recorded a chill ambient album that was fairly simple, but there's so much into it, you know. This is beat with, like without beats or barely any beats, just atmospheric sounds, and making it was so rich and soloing and stuff. I can only imagine on the other end what people will do, you know. It's uh, I release it like exactly like you said. I release a full album like this mm -hmm. in uh, stems, uh, all the templates, including barely any plugins because I don't use so many plugins in my production. And, you know, people on the other end, I think they're, they're excited. You know, it's not, uh, it's not a big EDM thing. It's a very out there spatial thing. But it's, it's, it's the value is immense. I put my heart into it. Of course, it's, it's, it's my music. You know, mm. I didn't just put those out there. It's, it's really advanced. You know, it's uh, my 15 years of, of, uh, of music production in there. So I think people, I, th I do believe people enjoy it. So, yeah. It's a, I believe it's a new format. Some people do it. Uh, Moby really stems all the time. More people are releasing it. I've seen that on YouTube uh, lately. Some people, some Latin music. Uh, you can just get the stems there and remix it, you know, because I think they want people to play with their music and to make their versions. So, and DJs to do something with it to, I guess, more get more exposure, put it out there as much as possible, you know. So, I think it's, it's the phenomenon that is quite current. So, hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, are you mm -hmm. talking about, um, like, the term stems I want to ask you about? Are you talking about mm -hmm. this, like, uh, native instruments uh, format that's relatively new? Or are you just using the term stems, like, okay, these are my bass tracks printed? These Yeah. Are my... Well, stems, native instruments, stems are limited to four channels. They're for DJs. They're good. I mean, this is a great thing because it's progress into the DJ world to going into, uh, you know, a more performance base, you know, with live mixing. Right. But yes, what I'm talking about, of course, is full stems, which uh -huh. maybe uh, five years ago, downloading a gig or two would have been a problem. Now it's more feasible, you know, with, mm -hmm. with the technology we have, with the fiber optic connection. So yeah, stems, you know, stems yeah. are uh, like a common, not, I guess for me, it is a commonplace thing, maybe not for, for the people we're gonna, that going to listen to us. But yeah, we actually have those on the site too. We, we encourage people to do that. So 
the benefit is you take it and you drop it in, uh, you know, it could be uh, Reaper, it could be uh, Pro Tool, it could be Ableton, it could be Logic. You drop them in there and you chop it. You do, you know, you can experiment really and can have the, the groove, can have the bass. Some people, at least I did that. I also put the, the reverb channels, you know, the sand effects channels because okay. I think it's a, it's a part of the texture, you sure. know, it's a part of the track. And if you don't have that, it's not going to sound the same. So you put those separately and people can, can play with that. It's, it's mm-hmm. just sounds. And with the modern DAWs, well, sky's the limit, really. You yeah. can, you know, you sync it, boom, you just chop and go and remix and add. And with, with Ableton, you could go much further, you know, I would say then with Logic creatively, uh, with all the sand, sidechain, effects, cutting, and even the samplers, it's, 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 it's mad, really. So the possibilities are just really infinite with, with, with those, you know. So. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's a great thing to think about. You know, as you're releasing your music, especially in an electronic genre, where um, you're making it easy for people to use your stuff and help basically promote your music at the same time, mm-hmm. and be creative with your own sounds, it's um, it's a it's always a good thing to make it easy, right? Because uh, yeah. otherwise, you know, people might just move on to the next thing. Sort of like what you're saying about on Beatport, you know, just carry on, move on. But it's a uh, it's very cool. Um, are you um so you mostly it looked to me like most of your stuff when you release it you're also putting out the project files and the whole package right yeah all the music i released in the past five years is mm-hmm. on the site as a template pretty much i most of the time i would not even use a plugin i get some in logic pro i get some in ableton i had some fun in ableton but uh as a mix engineer and stuff, it just doesn't, it's not really for me. I, I tried, I, bu- I bought it actually, and I'm like, oh, this is this is nice, let's play. But it's a different It's a different style of composition, you know, as yeah. if you, I was Nuendo first, like a long time ago in uh, 2001, Nuendo, Cubase, a long time, Nuendo, Cubase. And then I fell into Logic uh, five years ago, and well, mm. then I went to Ableton Little, and then Logic, because I work with a lot of people that work with Ableton. But I don't know. Logic is still, it's right. still the winner for me. It's yeah. it's, it's hard it's very comfortable. to. Yeah. Well, the UI now I know more about Ableton. Actually, talking to some people and watching some some what people can do with it, and creatively, it's much better. But the UI and the interface for me is confusing. So it's my my point of view. It's not you know. So, but creatively, that is that is a bomb. I mean, wow, what you what can you do side chain wise and. All the tricks. Whoa! This is this is. I think if I would have all these, I would get lost. So I would not make music. I would just have fun. <laughs> yeah. So that's a bit of a problem. That that is a, that does happen sometimes. Yeah. Well, but this is how yeah. the creative process happen. You have to experiment and try, and then something like that really vibrates with you. Come out of it, and then you go and you go for it. But then this come with experience. You know, I I can tell you that. Uh, Maybe six years ago, I was finishing half of my track. Now I finish ninety-five percent of what I make. You know, I mm. finish it. It, it, it just oh, that's come. Good. I want to, I want to execute. It's I guess it's the practice. You know, the the work, and then you're like, okay, yeah, I can do that. I can arrange it this way. Or this time, I'm gonna make something completely different. That mm-hmm. everything that I know, I'm gonna put it aside, and I'm just gonna improvise completely. And then, wow, I made a track. You know, right? That's so. Hmm. All right, there's a couple things in there that I, I've, I've been like taking my little notes here. I want to, you know, side us off on. Uh, I think um, the point about the DAWs is more than anything, it's the one you're comfortable with is the best one. The one you know how to use, the tools, you know. I'm, I, I used Logic for a little while. I started with Pro Tools when I first got a computer to record music. And, you know, that was just what you got. So that's what I got. <laughs> and uh, I've, wound up really enjoying Logic a lot. Um, but when I got into Ableton Live, I, it kind of just took me away. Um, but I worked a lot different in Logic. You know, it's the left to right, you know, start to finish with an arrangement. And the thing mm-hmm. that I really appreciated about Live was the fact that I didn't have to commit to those arrangements right away. I could just throw my ideas. But the problem I run into is that I don't commit as much because I've, I, I don't ever have to really. Um, so sometimes like the restraints or the certain workflows that a DAW kind of like 
encourages you to take can really change the way you work? Well, totally. And one thing that's important to understand as a musician, you know, we use both sides of the brain and the creative have to go with the logical Mm. and you have to be able to put those together to finish a track because the creative is there. It's doing its job. It's amazing. It's like, yay, I'm doing all those cool things. Great. But you also have to get the logical. I don't know if this is why they call logic logic. Maybe. (laughs) Who knows? But, but, uh, but if you are able to put those together, then you're going to finish some track. Mm. You know, it's, 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 this is difficult, you know. The creative part, me, just want to go and create. And I like sound design. I like synthesis. I like to play with sound and stuff. And sometimes I could spend hours jamming, you know, with a synth. And I like Arturia synths, personally. They're really cool, really jammy. Play on the keys. Play, put some reverb. Play with some stuff. Write a few melodies. But just jam, you know, totally jam. Right. Nothing will come out of it but the pleasure. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is nice, you know, to, to, to jam like that. Like... With what we do, what is a bit sad is like we're jamming all apart, you know, like before when I, when I was younger, I was jamming with my father and some friends, some people take some bongos, some take some guitars, some take some drums yeah. and we're all together jamming, you know, that, that is a feeling that nothing can reproduce, you know, this right. is like a, like a, there's a synchronicity, there's something between us that make us vibe, you know, same thing as a band that we don't have, you know, we do it for ourselves. But sadly, we cannot share it in real time. You know, I would like to open a track with you now and, and jam. Yeah. But it's, I guess it's not there yet. I, well, it's certainly going to happen, you know. But uh, yeah. this is, I think, what's missing a little bit in electronic music. And being able to work in the studio with some people is not the easiest thing, you know. Yeah. Some people have, uh, you know, different way to, to work, uh, to produce and stuff. And most, let's be honest, most electronic music producers, they work alone. You know, it's a, it's a little bit sad. It's fun to work with people. It's, this is, this is well, as human, this is what we are. And this is what's exciting, you know, to share. So well, it's got to be like parallel. the first time in history where musicians are probably playing alone, making these full compositions by themselves uh, close to as much as, if not more, than they do with other people. Where it's yeah. for me, it's become more and more rare that I play with other people. And I'm like you. I mean, we grew up playing guitars together, and it you you really. If I maybe had a tape recorder and I hit record and recorded my guitar, I could play over that later. But that was as far as I could get it for a long time. Exactly. This is, and there really is something to that like connection that happens with another person that um is is. I don't think you get any other way. Yeah, it's it's a progression, but but a regression. You know, it's the same thing yeah. we're talking about, like the 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 corporation is the same thing with the quality of music. You know, where we went to super high end vinyl and tape cassette, which were actually pretty good. You know, for a certain time after that they degrade, but and then now we're going into degradation. You know, this is a bit sad that the, right. as as human we want to be social, want to be with people, want to have the the best for ourselves, but no, it's going in the opposite direction because. Technology facilitate everything, and then it kind of separates everything. It's, mm. it's, let's. Uh, I'm doing my best personally to try to get with people, but uh, I'm a bit in the middle of nowhere here, so that yeah. doesn't really help. So. Well, you've done it through community on your site, that's for sure. And uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's one way I deal with it too. You know, through the community, through the podcast, things like that. Just. Uh, I have to seek it out maybe a little more than I used to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned um, how you're not really using too many plugins. I wanted to mm-hmm. ask you about that because um, uh, first, uh, I assume maybe you're meaning um, you're using more like the stock plugins and no, not yeah, as much use, third-party stuff. I use uh, Logic's internal mm-hmm. uh, mainly, and uh, I don't use things like uh, uh, filter plugin or something like that because an EQ is a filter there's no point into doing that and mm-hmm. I guess I guess I don't need it I don't feel it's necessary to do anything you know and I think I think music creation if you put yourself constrained you're going to be able to deal with what you got and something else will come out of it as if you go wild you might never finish track maybe it is a part of why I finish tracks now because I really put the frame and I stay within this frame, you know, and I use, uh, I use silent, but now um, Logic come with uh, really good uh, synthesizer, so I don't need it so much. And it's all, I don't think it's relevant to making music. I'm yeah. probably like you, I don't know if you went to that phase, but uh, 
that was uh, about uh, eight, nine years ago. I had a studio and man, that I had some gear. Eh? <laughs> I had a virus TI, I had Supernova, you know, I had a Nord, I had like sound cards, I had three sets of speakers. It was massive, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had all those things, but I wasn't finishing any track. Right. So, <laughs> so as great as it was, you know, those, those synths are amazing. I would love to have them now much more than ever because I would probably spend the time to do something with them. You know, a synthesizer is not something you can learn in the, in a week or a yeah. month or even a year, you know. If you have yeah. a good, really big synthesizer like a virus like or a Nord Lead or something, this, you know, you have to get your hands dirty into it to make something. Same thing with the plugins, you know, some, mm -hmm. some people, yeah, the presets are great, but there's so much more into it. Yeah. You have to play. So yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think it's again at the sense of the creativity, the less you have, the more you're going to do. Mm. It's uh, maybe it's a bit of an Apple purist thing because I'm a big uh, Apple fanboy. you want to call if you want, <laughs> but, uh, it's there. This is it. You make music, you play with the scent, you refine, you craft, you just make the best out of it. And then I think something great is going to come out. My, yeah, my last album is silent. I use only nice. silent one. I don't even know if I use anything else. Hmm. Uh, yeah, not really. No, not, not so much. It's, it's, it's enough. It's a big synthesizer. It's a huge synthesizer, sure. 64 voices. It's, you know, it, it has a lot to it. And I think it's this with Logic plugins. I'm happy. And processing too is the same. You can buy uh, sidechain things, sidechain that, but the Logic compressors are amazing. You can do anything with it. In Ableton, you can do even more. You can sidechain everything to anything to anything. You can really creatively push the envelope of what is possible that's never been possible before. It's, it's, it's quite intense. So... I think uh, Ableton's got more than enough for anybody to write all the music in the world. You know, it's, you don't really need to to invest two thousand dollar into a bunch of plugins. You know, that's making the work for you. So, I, I agree with you totally. Um, I think we're getting less and less uh, intimate with our gear as there's more and more of it. Whether it's a plugin, whether it's a synth, uh, hardware, whatever. Uh, there's so many more options available that we don't get to know things. I mean, I grew up like really learning every little piece of gear I ever had because it's all I ever had. I didn't have a computer full of plugins or I didn't have options. So I really learned my little reverb pedal on my guitar. <laughs> it, yeah. it, was, it was all I had to play with. Um, when I started doing more of the digital stuff on the computer, though, I went through I went through a time period, as as I'm sure a lot of people do, where you start going to the dark alleys of the internet and you collect all the plugins you can get. I, I had a little period where I was, uh, I, I mean, I was just really, all, I thought I was making music. I was really just learning how to crack software. That's really all I was doing. And I, I had a ton of plugins and I didn't know how to use any of them. And I was making no music after a few months. And I, I finally just said like, you know, what am I doing? I, I'm not making any music. I had nothing to show for all this time I've been spending on it. And I, I kind of decided to just really focus on only using the stuff that was inside live. Because I, I said to myself, if I can't make music with this super advanced software <laughs> and uh, I need other stuff, I, I really can't do it. And it made me a lot more productive by just getting rid of all that stuff and not even having it as an option. And yeah, that's. I still have like for me synthesizer wise. Yeah, I bought uh, Arturia Collection. Wow, this is nine years ago, and eh? they still support it. I still get update. Mm. <laughs> this is amazing. Wow, that's but great. I use them. I use them sparingly. You know, I'm working on a track. I'm like, oh, I want a fat bass. Or I want some pads. You know, CSV eighty uh, eighty. Oh, wait, CSV twenty. Um, I don't even remember the name of this this plugin. But you know, I want some rich pad. You know, this this big replica. And I'm like, wow, you put it on, it's like, that is nice. And then you process it and you do the work on it. But there is a use, but not loading all the plugin on every track and then going like yeah. like a maniac trying to put stuff in there. <laughs> and 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 again, creating music is, is simplicity, you know, is is key. And it's just the very hardest thing to do. I, th I think you go through phases. I think I went to phases I was making stuff that was simple and stuff, but I, I push. Uh, well, I had digital mixer, tried to do all kinds of things when I started in the early uh, 2000s. And then I went into a phase where I wanted to make that big sound with all those things, where I really wanted to just put that much more to impress people. 
And then you pull back and then you pull back and then you pull back and then you bring it to very simple, clean ideas, you know, that really express something, you know, yeah. that I think it's a baseline, some keys, a bit of melody, some sparing vocals, done, you know, it's, it's a track. It's, yeah. it's, but every idea is crafted and refined, you know, you just don't do one take, you finish it and it's done. You really go into it. You listen, I, I don't know if you like that. I think a lot of people that make music like us listen to their track a hundred times, you know. You mm. sit, you listen to if you listen to it a hundred times, it's because it's good, hopefully. Right. And 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 then and then you might want to change something, or then you take a break, you go back to it, you do something. But you really you really have to put everything you got into that that sound, that little thing. And I think uh, like many people, a mix is never really completely finished. Mm -hmm. But you can still decide, you know, really to put the line. You're just like, oh yeah, I think. I think this is good now. I think I think I really put everything I got because if you do it again, it will change. You know, it will obviously change. It will always progress and change. Right. So you have to put a stop to it, which is sometimes difficult. Yeah. Well, there's always another thing you can try and uh, not that it's right or wrong. It's just another direction you can go. During this episode of the podcast, Mikas and I talk a bit about collaborating with other artists. And we also talk a little bit about not losing your projects due to a catastrophic hard drive failure or some sort of tragic event that can cost you years of work, really. And I thought that tied in nicely with our sponsor, Splice. Splice has a service called Splice Studio, which is essentially a cloud-based backup service for your DAW projects. It allows you to see past versions of your projects. So if you make a change and you don't like it, you can go back to an older version. So it'll save you the risk of losing your projects, say to a hard drive failure or some other catastrophe that may happen. But it's also a nice way to collaborate with other artists. You can share your projects with them, they can download them, and they can make their own changes. You can see the changes they've made, and you can still access the other versions that you've already had. So in case somebody makes some wild changes you're not so happy with, you can make your project go back to the way it was. You can head over to splice.com slash afrodjmac dash create to access Splice Studio. And if you use the code AFRODJMAC, you'll get a free month of Splice Sounds while you're at it, which is a great way to add some cool sounds to your projects. So head over to splice.com slash AFRODJMAC dash create. Yeah, I wanted to sort of ask you a bit about uh, finishing music. It's one of the things I think people struggle with the most. I know I struggle with it all the time. I, I hear a lot about it. Um, but you're saying like these days you're really cracking down and finishing most of the things you start so do you have any yeah. advice what do you what, what's changed for you i mean is, is, is it just the uh limiting your tool set and getting rid of all the gear and plugins or is there more to it than that mm, i think it's experience it's the time you know it's the way to learn to arrange and to commit i think it's commitment you mm. know if you commit to a track and then you started and you're halfway you know i don't want to close the session I want to, at, at the bottom line, you know, do the, the, the intro, you know, the first verse, uh, breakdown, another verse, like main breakdown, and then commit to the structure, you know, put the structure into place. And then after that, do the full arrangement, mm. but really have at least the scaffolding of the track with the elements together. And then once you have that, you know, you can build into it and might, you might change it, but at least you have that, you know, because... Depending on what you do, if I do more progressive stuff, the elements will stay, they will evolve, they will change, filtering, more echoes, and, you know, different things will go into it. But the elements are basic, you know, there's not going to be uh, 20 cents, there's going to be 5 cents, you know, and those 5 cents will be at the core of it, and I can place them into the track. And once they're placed, well, you know, I, I can work them further, further, add some percussions, remove some things, uh, do some compression, and a mix, I think a mix is 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 the really the final step. You know, once it's arranged, then you put all the elements. You might put some risers, some effects, uh, you know, to do better arrangement. But then it's the mix. You know, this is where it all really, to me at least, this is where it's really happening. You know, the the final result of the track. I would arrange it. I would finish it. I would drop all the level if there's no automation. Hopefully, at this point, I would drop all the level and I would mix it from scratch, starting with a kick. You mm -hmm. know, to 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 finish and usually after that it's 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 pretty it's pretty clear what what it will be you know hmm. 
Yeah, I think the structure, the arrangement is definitely an important thing. And you, you so you're really dividing the jobs then. You're, you're um, like you said, you once you get it down, then you turn everything down and you start mixing from scratch. So mm -hmm. you're also separating your tasks a little bit. Well, if it's mixed properly, it will be pleasurable to hear and over and over yeah. and over again. And it will have the sound that I desire, you know, that's... And well, that comes with experience because mixing a track, if you don't know your frequencies and if you're not really have developed a proper year to be able to mix, it's difficult. This is one of the hardest things. It took me, uh, I don't know, it yeah. took me maybe, maybe honestly, uh, 10 years before I understand. I give you a good example you might relate to 300, uh, let's say um, 300K to uh, 1200, you know, the 3 to 1200, you know, that zone, you know, that is. Not so tangible, unless you have a very sweet studio. It's 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 one of the hardest to mix properly and to have resonate, you know. And then the low end, of course, is also another complete chapter. But this zone for me has always been a bit of a problem, you know. And well, I made some track that worked. Some other definitely didn't work. And you have to develop the year. It's it's you have to yeah. train. I don't know. You have to to get to understand all the frequency and all the act and and. Sadly, in electronic music, there's no rules. Well, <laughs> greatly and sadly, I mean, right, I don't know right. how to express that. <laughs> so there's no rules. So there's no, okay, this instrument is a bass. No, this instrument could be a lead. It could be a kick. It could be anything, mm -hmm. really. So, so there's, no, there's no guiding line, you know. You, it's all about your own creativity and how hopefully it's going to be received on the other end when the, the audience will listen to it. So Right, yeah, the blessing and the curse. At least in like yeah. rock music, you know, usually things sit in there. The bass is low. The guitars are a little bit higher. <laughs> oh, great. <Yeah. laughs> Perfect. I can, I can mix that. You know? your, um, but, your frequencies you mentioned, though, like about 300 to 12 or, or whatever, um, mm -hmm. those are tough frequencies because pretty much everything has information in there, no matter exactly. what. I mean, mm -hmm. you might have a bass part that has nothing up in the high registers or maybe some cymbals that are you know you can pretty much cut everything in the very lows but almost everything's got some life there and it's very hard to decide what's going to work and what's uh you know what little carved area does this sound get and where does this one get to go in that very populated frequency range so you have to pick you mm -hmm. have to pick what what you want to be there. What uh, what we call, I guess, an engineering thing is the body of the track. You know, if you let's let's put it in perspective in a club. You know, if you have a function one sound system, it will deliver great body. It will you could feel it. You know, it's really gonna go through you. If you have a poor sound system, then the bass is gonna kick. You're gonna have the high, but there's not gonna be any middle, which is what you can play with people. This is really, I think, I believe it's where you can create emotion. This is really mm -hmm. where you can make people vibrate. You know, with that. Let's say 400, you know, four to 600, you can really have a, like a groove there, something like some, some drums, you know, that, that create rhythm and maybe some, some nice pad that is pushing the track, you know, well, if you go higher, you can put like the lower part of the vocal in there to make people vibrate to it. And it's, 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 it's so rich, you know, it's, it's, this is the key. And this is why I think it took me so long to really mm -hmm. get that, you know, and some engineer would work it completely differently. Some engineer, ex example, uh, I, I watch a Drake producer, you know, he put his voice, I think at 2000K, it's all at the top and there's really no, this is weird, you know, to me, some, some are different, but to me doing that is not good, but it worked very well for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really, uh, it's a thing where he cut the, also all of the high end of all the beats, all of it. There's, I think there's nothing above 6K, you know, there's just right. nothing at all. So it's like I was watching that interview. I was like scratching my head. I'm like, okay, but it worked. Yeah. So there's not really any standard that you can apply at any time. You just, as a producer, you have to do what your gut tell you, I believe. You know, you're just like, okay, that sounds good. You know, but you have the reference monitors. You listen to it in three different outputs. Do you really are confident with this mix that you just finished you know so that's that's another quite important point you know to to, to put out there for 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 people yeah and that's funny because i think that sort of like dull sound on a lot of drake's songs are part of his sound like where a yeah. lot of the music almost sounds like it's underwater every once in a while and it allows his voice to sit right on top nicely too yeah it makes a that's... lot of room for everything else mm -hmm. on top 
But that's a bit sad engineering wise because there's so much more to play with yeah. than just this. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I would side chain the heck of the voice with some drums play and just to me create push pull, create richness, like mm. create movement. But then, I mean, I'm not a Drake engineer, so sadly I can't do that just yet, I guess, or something <laughs> like that. So, so it's, it's, yeah. So this is the, the choice that people have. And this is one of the fundamental, I think that people should understand when they create electronic music is the frequency. And sadly this fundamental is, is wide. I mean, it's from from like twenty to twenty thousand k, and there's a lot to it, you know. And the, this this part for me was the key to my mixes, you know. This three hundred to twelve hundred was mm -hmm. what I was lacking most of the time, you know. Or if you have an acid bass who's gonna peak around three to six hundred, it's gonna take over the whole track. It's gonna eat, you know, the rest of the material if it's not mixed properly, and then it will. I'm gonna say it will sound off, but it would be just just not balance, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, you're taking away impact. It mm -hmm. it was a, the the way I really came across this, like I, I see like the frequency spectrum, if we go to like 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, to me, that's almost like a paint, like a canvas that you paint on. Mm -hmm. And if I think about it like left to right, the left being really low, just like you would in the, in an analyzer. And I just like picture like I can't put my tree of my painting, I can't put the house, I can't put the sun all in the base. Everything can't be basey, or else because then you won't see anything. They'll all be just a big blotch of paint. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that with electric guitars, especially um, cutting out the low end of a, of a guitar. I mean, the guitar the low E string is like eighty hertz, and um, you really don't need anything below that. And honestly, a lot of times you don't need. A lot of frequencies above that even and i i mm -hmm. i think a big thing that caused me problems was listening to things in solo too much because my guitar oh. would sound awesome in solo but then when you put it in yeah, the mix yeah. it's all muddy because everything sounds awesome in solo <laughs> really I, i'm not aware of that because i never listened to anything in solo but that's, that's well yeah, well that's as good. i'm say like you know when i'm starting out if i'm mixing um my guitar i'll, I'll solo it i'll make it sound beautiful on its own and then I'll go to the bass, I'll go to the drums, whatever order I go in. Okay. You know the thing, you make everything sound beautiful on its own, but the fact of the matter is you really have to make sacrifices in the sound to make it fit with the other sounds and let the other sound do the work. Let the bass guitar carry the electric guitar in the low end instead of letting the electric guitar mop up and muddy up the bass. Yeah, that's... that's at least you have rules, you know, you have instruments that have rules. If you don't, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's difficult. For me, it came to like really early in the days of, of my music production. I bought uh, Bobby Owinski mix engineer handbook, and mm. him his vision that I could picture myself still today is he created a three dimensional room, you know, with 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 the elements, you know, where you can. And I believe there was a picture in the book, if I remember well. I've read that it was on my bed table for quite some time, mm -hmm. and and he said a room, you know, so you put a room, and then you try to fit your things like you would put furniture in it, you know, to to but because sound right. are not two dimensional, they're three dimensional. You can create depth. You can have forward, you can have backward, you can yeah. have up and down. So the frequencies are everywhere. So this is the way I picture that. Even today, when I listen to to a mix, either here or you know in the headphones, I can I can feel maybe the depth of a of a track. You know, if you want, you can put a lot of thing in the corner there. It, it's totally doable. And then put something here and play with them and move with them. Hmm. So it's I don't think. Many of the listener will not realize, but this is the craft. This is the art of, of really being able to put a track together. If you listen to older song, which I happen to, I go to Apple Music, I put a classic rock, okay? And then I listen to some ACDC and then the lead guitar is here. And then there's some stuff here and there's some, it's very composed. It's, it's very strange, you know, the way, the way rock and roll was made, but it worked. It really worked. Uh, doing that in electronic music, it's a no. It's a whole other world, and the most complicated thing I think that comes to that is that if you want your mix to sound good in a big room or a big sound system, you cannot play so much with the stereo, cannot play so much with things because most people won't hear it. Right. You know, if you are on one side of the room, you won't hear. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I'm uh, really fond of Function One Sound System because they do deliver really what dance music is about, at least in, in my point of view. And uh, that 
it translates well, very well. The, the stereo and stuff, they made it so it's, it's more centered, but you still have a little bit of it, you know, not, not immense, but still a little bit of it, and that shows. And if you mix dance music and stereo, I believe it's a big mistake because nobody will hear it in stereo unless you're able to do a DJ mix and a iTunes mix, you know, which is not really possible. So it has to be, at least in my opinion, more centered and maybe play a little bit with the sides, mm. but not so much because it was saying mixing in mono. Uh, most people listen to dance music in mono in front of 10,000 watts of speakers, you know, or in a club where it's very loud and there's a lot of sound pressure and you don't really... You don't really get to hear the music, you know, so much as you feel the music, you know, so. Yeah, important to consider where people are going to be listening to your music, what they're going to be doing. What uh, kind of yeah. Yeah. I like, to, I like to say that the music I release on the label that I created is going to be as enjoyable in the club as it will be on the bus, you know. Uh -huh. So some of electronic music is a bit, I mean, unless you really love it, which is fine. So if you really love it, anything, any, anywhere, at any time. But a lot of it, you listen to it sometime and some, and then it's like, oof, this is a bit hard, you know. Mm -hmm. As if it's really melodic and you have some element, you have musicality to it. Then I think it's acceptable everywhere, and it, it should be. But then some, some of it will not represent that well on the dance floor, like at two in the morning. Right. <laughs> so I think it, I think it's a choice to make. I think now with Future Bass as an example, which I really enjoy personally, not all, but some of it, because it's breakbeat. It's a bit more evolved. It could be a bit more complex to create, and it's musical. Mm -hmm. It's not so much as uh, some of the techno or some of the repetitive music that is out there. It has some substance to it, you know. And if you had a singer to it, then you had no. You had Justin Bieber to it. You just made number one hit. That's it. This is what you do. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this how they do it, I guess. Uh -huh. But 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 it work for an audience. It will also work in the dance floor. Mm. I find it interesting how different genres sort of like command a different way of listening. Like for instance, um, I'll say you have um, a type of dance music, maybe something that's more minimal, a little more repetitive, like you say. You start paying attention to like the tone changes in the hi hat, and that becomes like a focus. Like when there's much less to pay attention to you start yeah. realizing the little things that are happening. But if you put, you know, a lead vocal and then some kind of melody in there, you're never going to even notice what happens to the hi-hat. No, your brain is way too up there captivated yeah. by the vocals. Yeah, the vocals, of course, we're human, you know, it's going right. to always catch our primary attention. But then, yeah, there's so much more, you know. I, I don't say minimal music is not enjoyable, but... Yeah. To be able to sit on the bus and listen to a Plastic Man album an hour, I can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. as much as I love the man because he created some of my interests for electronic music in the the 1990s, you know, I cannot listen to it on the bus, you know, on the train or on a plane or something like that, just because I it's just not gonna, yeah. just not gonna make me groove. You know, it's just uh, but on the dance floor at yeah. five in the morning. Either in a club or in a warehouse. Oh yeah, that's this is this is gonna you know the repetition create that 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 just like that tick you know it just hypnotizes you completely and then you're into it and you're like man this is great you know when yeah. I started going to to parties in the 1990s I had no idea what was the music I was dancing to but I was dancing I can tell you that mm -hmm. so <laughs> I just I had no clue I don't remember I have no idea really it was so out there it was so new. That it just hits you and then the vibe is there and everybody's dancing. You're like, wow, this, yeah. is, this is crazy, you know? So it was not important, you know, back then at least. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of music, right? I mean, like, there's a different time and place for everything. And you, you, uh, you might love your favorite singer songwriter, just guitar, sad song when you're feeling terrible one day and then sitting in your room or something. But you're not going to put that on at the pool party or at the dance floor. <laughs> it's just not going to yeah, work yeah. there. And just the same as like maybe you're getting ready for bed at night. You're not going to put on some like solid four to the floor that's going to make you feel like you keep going for the night. You want to wind yeah, down a little definitely. bit. It's um, There's a time and a place and it's uh, important to know that. And It's kind of like interesting to think about um, if you know the time and place for your particular kind of music is the dance floor that those sound systems are now a real big consideration in your mixing and in your production. I mean, they, I think they should be. Mm. But then again, 
this and if you I think if you make that in a proper studio and then you send it to a proper engineer, it should translate, you know, but it doesn't right. mean it will because you never know like really what will work. This is this is the case of uh I think I think DJs have it better. You know, people that have a lot of experience behind the deck, they have it better at creating what will make the the the, the crowd go, you know, yeah. as as Maybe for other more composer like me or some things like that, it would be like, well, you know, uh, Carl Cox, you just play the same loop for like three minutes, but they know it work. You know, they know that the crowd love it. They know it, it just translate to them because because it has that they have that knowledge of what work as some people, they create music. Uh, I give you an example, like a large example, like dubstep, you know, where dancing to that is difficult. To say the least, you know, as drum and bass also, dancing to drum and bass is, is fairly difficult. As dancing on 4-4 is more, it's easier, but it doesn't diminish the value of it, you know. It's it's a very good, strong genre with some very innovative sounds and, you know, it's, 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 it's really on its own a phenomenon, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, it's not like the most danceable music in the world. I went to some dubstep party and I've seen Skrillex live uh, in front of a... Uh, 40,000 people and yeah that was kind of weird but the music was really good so uh-huh. that made it you know <laughs> that's not so dance music is dance music but I think what is really house music and deep house and progressive house and those are really been crafted to make people groove and dance and have a good time you know as other style of music are quite out there you know but they still create strong feelings and people are like having a blast to them you know so yeah. not to be judgmental but it's very it's, no, no. it's varied you know so the, the 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 feeling of what will translate to people is is just so so different it's so out there their experience are so individual it's so it's so complex you know but we're lucky now we have a uh, hundred different jars and uh, thousands of labels releasing all of this music and you know you want some music you can listen to music all your life and you track all the time and you won't be done when you're dead. So yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. Well, it's got to be like the trick of producing it too because you're making a, a type of music that is designed to move people and is built off how people react to it, yet you're alone in your studio <laughs> and you don't have that feed. It's too bad you can't like bring the dance club in real quick just to see, is this working? <laughs> okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's that's a difficult thing. I, I know some people that I work with that had the function one sound system in their home. Oh yeah, to test it. Well, dead mouse I have one like uh-huh. uh, famously in a living right. room. There's a good reason to that. Eh? There's a very good reason because finish a track in the studio and those beautiful speakers, great. Uh, now what do we do now? You know what do we do? Either you have mains, you know those big mains, and then. You just crank it up to 120 dB in the studio and you just get get it punched into your chest. Or you go in the living room, make yourself a coffee, and then you blast it with some massive subs that are just pushing it to get a feeling and you know it's going to work or not. Mm. You know, I think it's important uh, if you're a known artist and you want to test a track, you know, you don't test it live on a big uh, stage because you might have a surprise. Right. You know? It might be muddy. Who knows? So Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, it definitely. I think especially electronic music is. Um, it's really important to have it those volumes where you really feel it, where because yeah. it's a, it's a very physical type of music that it, it vibrates you. Where I, I I, you know, I don't think it's the same. Oh, I mean, it's always great too to go to a live loud rock concert and like feel the. But I don't think like um, rock albums are so built on that idea of like physically vibrating your body mm-hmm. yeah totally it's, it's if you don't have to me if you don't have a 115 120 db of, of, of intensity with some bass it just doesn't you know i was mixing in one of my studio before not here not where i'm right now but in vancouver and i set it in a very small room so it was a very tiny room i put acoustic panels everywhere i put a sub i put two nice speakers and i was mixing maybe 120 125 the best track I made came out of there. Mm. It was just, it had just had that intensity and the sub was very reliable, very tight. You know, it was um, Newman. You probably know Newman. So it was all, no, it's now it's uh, Klein. No, it was Klein and Normal. Now it became Newman's. 
And I had the punch, you know, I know that when I was mixing a track, I could feel it. I just crank it up. And when I was mixing or mastering stuff for, for the clients, so if we make dance music uh, as, as an example, or for my clients or for people I work with, it, it just sounded tight because the room was just tight and I had a club feel. I had really club feel. And if I actually closed the door completely, it was too much. I had to crack open about maybe six inches to have some venting because if not, the, the, the pressure was so intense, you know, but I get lucky. I had the concrete wall here, concrete wall here, and then some space, you know, so it was, it was really, uh-huh. and it was, was really good thick acoustic panel that was really sucking in all the bass and it was, it, it had that, that richness. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's, I think that this is, this is what people should, should consider. I know people make a track on their notebook on the plane and they're going to play it. And it's okay, I guess it is okay at work, but to me as an engineer, I I would be I would be horrified, you know, to, to uh-huh. go and try something like that. I'll be, oh my right. god, no. <laughs> because in, in the past, when I started, I gave my music to, to DJs and CD, and they like it, so they played it live. And then when you get, I don't know if that happened to you, but when you get your first track played live in front of an audience by a DJ, it, it's not an easy moment, you know, it's not like, and then you hear it and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, that, 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 that could be a breaking point or, you know, you're like, okay, well, you know, that just wasn't that great, but yeah, I, th- I think people should think about that, you know, before they, they, they put on their music everywhere and they do a lot of mashups and things like that. And, you know, it sounds okay. And we're not even going to get into the topic of DJs playing uh, 120K, 28K MP3 from YouTube, you know, but uh, this, is not, this is a separate topic, not today. Yeah, well, I I agree with you. Like, I often encourage people when they're going to, like, bring their music live to the stage, you know, using Ableton Live or whatever. I, I often encourage people, you know, rent out a rehearsal studio with a good PA and just hear it there. Um, I have uh, PA speakers set up where I work because, uh, uh, you know, playing in bands or whether I'm doing my stuff live, I find that I am much better when I have the music kind of loud. Like we're creating, you know, my my creative process is almost a live performance in a way. It's just how I've kind of arranged my Ableton Live and MIDI controllers and things like that. Mm. And um, when I'm able to like stand up and like move and have the music loud and feel it, I'm much more likely to continue with it. Whereas sometimes when I'm sitting at the desk and I got the monitors and it's like still and it's a little more technical, it's easy to like kind of fall out of the emotion of the music. Whereas like having it loud and moving my body, I, one of the best things I invested in was like a desk, a table that was about like countertop height. So I could just mm-hmm. have all my stuff at a standing level and just be moving. Oh, sweet. And um, it's it's just uh, that physicality of it is so important. I mean, again, like I was a guitar player in bands before I ever did any of this. So when we played, we were playing loud band music. We were standing. I had my guitar on a strap, you know, and it was very physical. It, and yeah. sometimes you lose that. Um, it's I, or at least I think it's easy to lose like the physicality if you're programming things on little machines and. To be able to move is just so important to me. Yeah, that's not. This is exciting. Exciting when you create it, but uh, will it translate? Is is is, yeah. is the question. I guess if you're confident and you made hundreds of tracks that work, and your name is Afrojack, you know, great, perfect. Yeah, Afro Mac DJ. Let's not confuse. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, the, 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 for for a lot of the people that are making their music out there. They're like, oh, this is good, you know. And I think I think another aspect we should talk about is the confidence, you know, because you make music, are you confident to share it? You know, is it like now with the internet, you can drop it and people listen to it. You might get some feedback, or you might create artificial feedback. Who knows? But but is it really? Are you able to sit in a room with some people for them to listen to your music? This is a critical moment, you know. Mm. This is this is where things really resonate with people. You know, are you? gonna go to your friend and say hey man listen to my latest track you know are you are you just gonna stay in and keep on making music you know and i, th- I yeah. think this is this is one of the things that is extremely important today is to go out and share it with people you can share it with djs it's, but this, you know you can 
share it with your mom, as far as I know, you know, I, you know, it took me, it took me uh, 17 years of production until my mom said your last song almost made me cry. <laughs> Great. That took me a while, <laughs> but uh, she doesn't like the kick drums. So, uh -huh. you know, it was uh, more melodic, much more film score -y, big thing, you know, but then she was really proud of me, but uh, anything that's got 4-4 didn't work for her because, right. you know, she's older and she's like, uh, uh, so I think sharing the music with people, no, not the internet is great. It's a great place for that. But real people is really where, where it happened. You know, yeah. go out there. Uh, I, I don't know if there's music listening club, but some people should start that or something. You know, there's book clubs, you know, maybe people should share more and exchange and, and collaborate and, and really get to listen to other people's music, not at home on SoundCloud, like, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I think this is uh, after the, the, the reclusion we did because of the social network, all the internet and stuff. I think, I hope at least that people should open and go and exchange, you know, and, and collaborate and say, Hey man, DJs shouldn't be about like, I got all those track, you know, you, you're not going to know what's my playlist. Say, Hey, you want my playlist, man? Here you go. Just, mm. just, I think this is what music is about. And once you, understand what art is really about, which is about sharing, then you might get there and be like, hey, let's start something. You know, like what you're doing is you're sharing so much knowledge, you're sharing things with people without expecting them to buy some stuff from you or buy your music or whatever. You know, it's simply to, to share at the core. It's art, you know, art. Uh, you can have the most beautiful painting on your wall if nobody sees it except you. Yeah, right. It's, it's a bit pointless. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you're quite selfish if you do that, let's be honest. Right. <laughs> but this, it's the same thing with musician. You know, you make all those beautiful tracks, but if you don't share them because you don't have the confidence to do so, because you don't have the outlet to do so, well, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. I would go to them and say, take your track that you don't release, upload it to our site. Somebody might enjoy it. Yeah, I'm going to do a pitch about my business. But really, this is what it is about. You know, it's like, what about you do something with it? You've been producing for five years. You've not even to really able to release things on label because labels are very particular. They want you to already have a rep. They have da, da, da. you have to have connections, so on, so on. What about you do something with it? You know, either share the stems, uh, create sample packs, do something. You know, some other people can enjoy it. You know, because if not, they might end up buried or. Worse, your hard drive crash and you lose everything. Like it happened probably to you and me, and it happened to me. Many, you know, so yeah, yeah. that's another s sad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I lost a couple of years since I I'm on Mac though. Nothing. I've lost nothing. Mm. So that's uh, you know. So that that's one of the thing. No, I've so, done yeah. the stupid thing of like erasing files I need. It's oh. always been my fault, honestly. Uh, but but it has happened. <laughs> well, b before I switched to Mac, when I was on PC and I was building my own PC crazy machine with five hard drive and all of this, mm. every six months I had to reinstall the OS. It was it was caputing. It was it was terrible. Mm. So I lost a lot. I lost sometimes six months of work, you know, of wow. a Cubase project and stuff. And I have quite a few of the tracks that I released back in the days that I do not have the project and I wish I would have the project now because I was, I would upload them to my site, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's the sad thing. Or I would, you know, I would do something with them, but uh, th th those are gone. So yeah, that's a shame. I mean, today I think you got to get like something going the cloud. I mean, storage is so oh, much yeah. cheaper. The hard drives oh, yeah, the are cloud. so much cheaper than they used to be. Um, you, you gotta make precautions because it's not if it's when, those, one of those types of things. It's not if it happens, when it happens. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, th I think I'm happy that to, to think about it. I'm happy to have my templates on my site. So they're there, they're in the cloud, they're yeah. multi-spread, blah, 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 you know, whatever. They're everywhere on the cloud. So if server crash, there's going to be 15 others that's going to have it. Good. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a safety net, you know, I think that that's important to safeguard your project whichever way, you know, because... They're valuable. I like to open Cubase project from, uh, what, 2006, 2007, which I still have, which I rework one of my breakbeat track that I absolutely love. That's called X Funk. That's really strange. It's a very, it's very interesting, but it's very strange. And I made that very early in my career after three years, but it's, it's just, it has something to this track that really touched me. Yeah. And while I haven't sold many copy or anything, the track itself has, has just a meaning for me and, Having the project still today, 
yes, that that's 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 a plus. Mm. So yeah, you get to see a window into your past, how you were working, and what's changed. And sometimes there's good things you forgot about. And absolutely, yeah. I, w- I was still innocent back then. I didn't know anything. I didn't care about engineering. I didn't care about mixing. I was caring about that groove, that weird breakbeat, 16 bar long break with patterns and changes, you know, that I wanted to make crazy, you know, that I wanted to to make. Uh, my inspiration was BT back in the days, you know, BT, Brian Tronso, which is a, you know, very, very out there producer that a lot of people don't know, by the way, but. Uh, uh, yeah, breakbeat. You know, that's that that's much more complex. That's different than a four four. And when you start creating pattern, you need to beats. That it's just deeper. It's not. It's not the same. So. Hmm. So, I wanted to ask you quickly about um, this whole idea of sharing all your music and putting it out there as a template. Um, I could imagine a lot of people being afraid to give away their secrets and give away their sounds and give away their production techniques. Um, how do you feel about all that? Is, is that ever a concern? Do you, do you think that knowing you're going to release your work as a template ever affects how you make it or, mm. or what you're working on? <clears throat> For me, it doesn't because I believe in the concept 100%. And I believe the way the music is moving forward is the way to be able to generate any revenue whatsoever off music, that's let alone electronic music, okay? Because you have music, uh, commercial music, and then you have electronic music, which fall into a subcategories of, uh, you know, maybe you get sell eventually. Uh, I think I think it's, it's the way forward. I think it will move on more and more toward something like that because artists, they just can't, they just can't make anything out of it. And if you... If, if I go a level deeper and if you talk about uh, copyrights and infringement and things like that, I think this is also going to be very democratized because everybody's stealing everybody's track and chopping it and mashing it and stuff. And, mm. and I think the original author, if he's got a hit, it's fine. He will, he will get his revenue, will get his royalty, will get his performance royalty, he's going to do some shows, and they will be fine for him. You know? But I think so many people have talent and they should share it. I'm not worried about copyright. Personally, it's something that I'm like, it's uh, it's not, unless you're in the 1% tier at the top, you're not going to make money. You know, there's a very fun fact that Elon Musk put out not so long ago that you should check somewhere. It's on the Twitter stream. Is that, uh, and he's not the only one who said that. So 1% of Spotify artists make 95% of the revenues. Mm-hmm. So you can forget about making money. I personally have a 300 track on Spotify. I make better on Apple Music for some reasons. I still sell music as a somebody who released music for 17 years now, which is uh, not 17, but um, 12. Uh, I still get people to buy me music. It's just, wow, I can't believe people still buy my music with all this stream availability and things, you know. But it's still, I still make 60 cents, you know. Mm-hmm. I still make every three months a couple hundred dollars, you know. And... I can imagine that very high level artist, uh, the label, the label is going to take a big cut of them and they're going to get something, you know, but it's yeah. never going to be enough to make a living. And I think raw talent should be a resource, you know, like raw talent people. I'm not saying like you, you do many things, but people that could sit at home all day, make amazing music should be rewarded for it. You know, mm-hmm. they should be considered, you know, with all of the, the, um, the the freelancer movement on the internet where you can sit at home, do what you love, do what you do best and make money. I think some people have a lot of talent creating, but they don't have the the the, the showmanship, you know, they don't have uh, the social skills to go out there and to promote themselves. Well, they can take an avenue like our platform to do good. And then on the other hand, somebody's going to get inspiration. Somebody could be anywhere is going to do something. So, so that 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 is really at the core talent is everywhere and at the same time it's rare you know yeah. uh, there's really a fair amount of people that upload to the site but of course the site is dominated by a core of maybe 50 guys that have just that talent I hear a lot I run record label for many years too and like raw talent you can hear dedication you can feel in the music 
that uh, the guy put everything he's got into it, you know, that, that, that shows, you know, that that's talent, you know, that's right. practice, that's dedication. And some people just have musical years and it, it flow better for them. But then you can have all of that. And after two years or three years or five years of career, you're going to quit because you got nothing out of it. You got no feedback, you got nothing, and you're still at home creating music while I think our platform and other platform are able to give chance to those people, you know. And and the other side of this industry, which is, let's say, the sampling industry as a whole, and all of this is that there's a lot of labels, you know, that make a lot of very boring sample pack because they're going to sell. And that, to me, I'm a bit offended by that, you know, because the concept of templates is you make a song you love and you put it out there. As a sample pack, you make sample pack because Future Bass is popular, put it together, it sounds like whoever and then people buy it and that that frustrates me a little bit you know because inspiration comes so if you're inspired by those sample packs that are average what are you going to put out is average or if you're a professional you can make something better out of it but if you're not it's just going to be the same old yeah. thing over and over again you know it, it, it's sad while somebody upload a template to the site and he put his heart into it and it's kind of future based it's kind of trap and it's kind of house music and nobody ever this didn't occur to anybody to put all of those together. And then the guy in the audience is like, wow, this is sick, man. I can do something with that. And then he transfer it, change it, and release it. And then he got success, you know. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, this is this is a story. You know, I can't tell you so many stories. We get some feedback from people that have done well. But I don't know all the stories, you know. I There, there are some dirty ones that I know that I can't even reveal because, you know, some very high-end, very very uh, high profile people bought some products and what came out of it sometime was a little, you know, something. So I'm not, I'm not going to mention, you know, but it's... Uh, familiar? Yeah. A little familiar maybe? Uh, yeah, it yeah. was pretty much a complete ripoff, but, you right. know, this is not of our... We're not... It's not a part of what we do, you know. We create inspiration. If you do it, you do it, man. This is okay. If the artist on the other end is okay with it, good. Yeah. If he's not... It's on his cam, not not ours. So anyway, gotcha. Yeah, well, I think like you know the idea of like templates are really useful. I mean, to look at someone else's work is uh, certainly inspiring, but also just to like kind of have a framework to work on, and um, just uh, you know, I mean, so many things in life that we do, you use some sort of guide to help you learn how to do it and to compare your progress with, and I think that's a, that's a good way to do it. It's something worth. Worth at least spending some time on. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a saying that I I thought of not, not not so long ago. You know, while I'm I'm building the business and I'm thinking about concepts and I'm thinking it's like it's just the simple thing is nobody ever created music that never listened to music. You know, yeah. So you have to have something. Right. So if you never listen to music, well, you're not gonna want to make future bass or you're not gonna want to make techno if you never listen to techno constantly. And you have to have a certain interest for it to go into it. You know, it's not going to be, hey, I went to that party and now I want to make music. My, my path was uh, six or seven years of uh, working in parties. Uh, I was in, uh, in Quebec. I was working. I was producing party. We did underground night. We did club nights. We did all kinds of things. And then I got my hand on a computer. I plugged it in the big sound system. And then I was like, oh, my God, this is sick. You know, <laughs> but it has yeah. to come from somewhere. You know, it's not... Uh, it's not laid out in front of you. And then the people that decide, well, the internet is there to help. You know, really, it is definitely there to to provide anybody with anything that they want, you know, really. So on, on that, yeah, we're in a good, uh, very good era. So Yeah, and I think you're right. We're all kind of standing on the shoulders of people that came before us. And, yeah. and that's... Um, you know that's why it's cool. <laughs> it's it's like this. The music is this story of human existence, and we're just mm -hmm. adding a little bit to it. And so is everyone else. Hopefully, we'll head into the future with greater ideas. Let's let's wrap it with you know better sound quality and dedicated, loving artists that make music. You know from the heart. You know people that that really are able to make it. You know into what they do, what they love to do. And make a living of it, you know, hopefully in an easier way than in the past, you know. So yeah. you don't have to be a Bon Jovi to make a living of your music, you know, because you have those, all those outlets and all those possibilities that are laid out in front of you that you can actually 
do something, you know. I think I'm grateful, you know, to the universe for that every day because I'm sitting here in my studio and I make music and I work with people, I give chances to people. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. And what's responsible of that is the internet, you know. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's how we're having this conversation right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it is, it is a cool thing. And it's, it's nice that um, the work you're doing uh, allows some people to make that music and gives them a little some extra incentive and maybe might be the thing that allows them to sit down tonight and make the next big hit that we're all going to love tomorrow. I hope so. <laughs> it might take some years. You know, it's early. I think five or six years is early. It's, it's, it's newer. Yeah. It's developing. You know, it's not, uh, you cannot reach the whole world, you know, with only a few people behind that. You know, it takes some time, takes some effort to take, uh, Technology, you know, a lot of a lot of things, you know, that, that have to to be to align for that to work, you know, and then one of the probably the most important thing now is the software and the quality of the software, the reliability of the software, and the fact that you can take a project for your computer and send it to me and I can open it, you know, that that is, you sure. know, personally, uh, wow, that that that's very good, you know, to, to to know that that can work, good. I didn't know that was possible. Until my co-producer sent me the file on that day, you know, or mm -hmm. when we started working together, you know, and we set up every Thursday and then we're like, oh, yeah, we can. Oh, is it going to work? What, how is it going to work? And things like that. That's it. You know? Yeah. Just a click and a open in an email, right? <laughs> and there it is. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Well, I think what you're doing is really cool and I wish you all the best on it and the time to come for another successful six years and another successful six years after that. <laughs> who, who knows? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Six years has passed and it works. So thanks a lot, man. I hope uh, your audience will enjoy our talk. I think we went deep, went sideways, went up and down. Yeah. And I think there's this is some very interesting to, to learn and to reflect on. I think this is what conversation is about. It's like, and then after that, you think, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, those things. And then you do some research. You get to you 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 pick curiosity, you know. That's right. That's that's what uh, hopefully ignite creativity later on. So yeah. Oh man, you have no idea how many times I've sort of sat back and thought about what I've talked about on this podcast, and it's motivated me to do something. So I appreciate awesome. your your uh, dose of inspiration in my life, and I'm sure everyone cool. else will too. Me too. Me too, man. Thanks a lot for that. It's. Uh, it was good conversation. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> so is the best place to send people we make dance music dot com? Yeah, we make dance music dot com. We have a YouTube channel with uh, two thousand videos of uh, screen recording of templates so people can see inside of them. Uh, I'm not so social and we make dance music isn't so much because I'd rather have people making music than go on social network. Mm -hmm. It's my personal thing. So, uh, yeah, I encourage people YouTube a little bit. You know, I'm still fond of YouTube, but the rest, I say go create music or go to wemakenicemusic.com, listen to what's there. If something uh, vibrates with you, get it. And you know that on the other end, somebody will get paid, you know, and on your hand, you get, get that fat trap track, I guess, yeah. or something else, you know. Well, yeah, and that's a great thing about it. It's, it's uh, producers helping each other, which is really cool. It's mm -hmm. a nice element to it. So cool. We make dance music dot com. Mikas, thanks so much for taking the time. Cheers. All right. Thanks everyone. <laughs>